welcome to Viper. Today, we're going to do a quick demo of Viper's endpoint detection and response solution and cover what makes this solution unique in the market. Now, our EDR solution includes a lot of features, many more than we have time to demonstrate. So for today, we'll focus on the core features that make this an EDR solution, detection, containment, investigation, and remediation. Many of the other features included in this product will be discussed as well, but you should leave this demo with a good sense for how the detection response parts of this solution will work for you. Before we get into the product itself, however, there are a couple key design principles to the Viper solution that I want to cover. First of all, you may be familiar with this graphic from some of our other presentations. What it's trying to show you is that given the universe of attacks, there should be multiple layers of security protecting your endpoints from possible compromise. EDR is the last of these layers, in some ways, a last bastion that unfortunately can't be fully automated. The response part of EDR implies that a human will have to look at the attack to figure out how to properly respond. It should be obvious, therefore, that a major goal of a good solution is, or at least should be, to block as much as possible using classic EPP techniques, signatures, next-gen AV, AI engines, whatever, to stop most attacks in their tracks before they get anywhere on the endpoint. If you rely too much on your EDR solution for even the simplest threats, you'll spend all your time just processing stupid attacks that a complete solution should easily block. For this reason, Viper's EDR is just a layer on top of the steel core of our EPP solution, Viper Endpoint Security Cloud. This EPP solution routinely scores in the top of the heap in independent testing for effectively blocking attacks, no muss, no fuss, while also not causing many false positives or putting a huge performance drag on the endpoint. But don't take our word for it. Go visit an independent testing agency like AV Comparatives and see for yourself. The result is that Viper's EDR solution will only escalate those alerts that you actually need to look at, saving you tons of time. Which brings us to our second principle, only surface what you need to. A large majority of endpoint attacks are already well known and can be immediately blocked. For example, many over-the-air network exploits, which can simply be rejected by our built-in IDS. These are so common that sometimes we'll call them internet background radiation. We'll report on these, but there's very little reason to look very deeply at them. They probably aren't directed specifically at a particular target, and they cannot have caused damage. That said, sometimes you might be curious about where they are coming from, especially if they are network threats originating inside your firewall, or you might want to look at trends. Another large chunk of attacks may make it partway onto the endpoint, but will be immediately blocked. This is essentially our EPP or next-gen AV feature. This can happen if something malicious makes it onto the endpoint, but is hidden inside a password-protected archive or something like that. We will, of course, immediately scan it once it's visible and go ahead and quarantine anything nasty. Or maybe there's a known threat, but it has been obfuscated a little bit, so we won't recognize it until it starts to run. In some cases, for example, it might be our machine learning behavior process detection that identifies something as being malicious. In most cases, we'll just kill the offending process and quarantine any infected files, stopping the threat cold. And again, you might not choose to investigate attacks like these. They don't represent much risk, so unless you want to know how they got in, you can leave them alone for a while. The last and least common type of attack are the ones that require the capabilities of an EDR solution to handle. These will be flagged in our platform as unhandled. Perhaps we identify a user account as engaging in suspicious activity. This would not be traditional file-based or process-based AV detection, but a behavioral pattern that needs to be looked at more closely. These incidents should be small in number and will be clearly indicated in our console so that you know you should look at them. They will also be ranked by severity so you know which ones to look at first. With all that said, let's get to the demo. We'll start on our main dashboard because before we get to the actual incident response, I wanted to highlight some key points about how you will use our console to do your work. Again, for EDR, one of the main use cases is threat response. And here in the dashboard, you can see an overview of the current state of your entire environment. You can probably imagine throwing this dashboard up on a big screen in your security operations center, but you can't always be in your SOC. In fact, more than three quarters of attacks happen after normal business hours. For this reason, we've put in a lot of effort to ensuring that this screen and every other screen in the product can be easily used even when you are out at lunch, on vacation, whatever. Every screen will work on any desktop or mobile device using any common browser. You can see here that the screen is cleanly rearranged so that you can still see all the relevant information you need. We've seen many other products where critical elements aren't visible on small screens, and in fact, the product may not even be usable. Viper EDR, however, is specifically designed to be usable anywhere on any device. The other thing you'll notice is that we've made our UI very responsive and interactive. You can explore the data you are looking at to help you understand the context, and your experience should be quick and smooth. You will see this more in the context of investigating an actual incident. Well, so now we need to create an actual incident so we have something to look at in the console. This is actually a little tricky because Viper will just block everything we already know about, malware samples and attacks we've seen in the past. 
So I sat down and created a little fake piece of malware, nothing special, but it will overwrite a bunch of files on the desktop. Since I literally just created it, it counts as a zero day, so to speak, and a traditional signature-based scanning won't immediately block it. If I run it here on this desktop, you'll see that pretty quickly the Viper agent will recognize that the script is engaging in malicious behavior, will kill the process, and will throw up a notification. You, you can also see that although some of the fake critical files here on the desktop are encrypted, most aren't because the process was killed. With that said, let's jump back into the Viper EDR admin console and see what it has to say about what just happened. I'll start by looking at the incidents tab, which is where new potential attacks will show up that we might need to look at. In our first view, you can see all recent incidents, most of which have already been investigated and closed. Using the facets at left, you can quickly zero in on any remaining active incidents or use any of the other filters. Note that Viper categorizes incidents into two main categories, auto-remediated, which means that the Viper agent automatically blocked the attack and cleaned it up, and unhandled, which means that the agent suspects that there might be an ongoing threat. Normally, we don't need to immediately review auto-remediated incidents, although we might still go back and do some root cause analysis, but unhandled threats we should try to look at quickly. Also note that incidents are classified by severity based on the specific activities that were observed, which can help you prioritize in the unlikely event that several incidents happen in a short time frame. You can see in this list that there's a new incident that took place on the machine VIP test and that is currently open. Let's take a closer look. Let's zoom in on this incident and look at the details. First off, right in the middle of the screen, we see the primary trigger that created the incident. In this case, that fake ransomware script that I created. Above that, we see a summary of the activity surrounding the threat, some process and file events, various severities, and the remediation action. We collect complete telemetry surrounding threat incidents from the endpoint, including detailed raw activity telemetry, as well as higher order events that we classify as security events and assign a severity. Above that, we have incident level info, such as the state of the incident and who is handling it. Since I'm doing the investigating, I'll go ahead and flip this to the investigating state and assign it to me. This happens automatically. Below the trigger, you can see the MITRE attack mappings that classify the type of activity we saw into the normalized MITRE framework, which can help you understand this attacker's tactics. In this case, we see masquerading, data encrypted, and so forth. Next, to the right, you see some summary information about the affected device, the hostname, IP, who is logged in, and so forth. And below, you see some details as to what the endpoint environment looks like which apps are installed and whether they are known to be vulnerable, and which of the Viper engines were running at the time of the incident. Taken together, this context can help you understand quite a bit about this threat and the endpoint it is targeting. For this particular incident, let's do some quick root cause analysis to see if we can figure out how this attack took place. In the middle here, you see the process tree, basically how the attack was started. The fact that this process was started by explorer.exe is a pretty good hint that there was a user who tried to open up this file on the endpoint. In this case, the scripting interpreter is doing some funny business, writing out a temporary file and executing that in turn. But more interesting is to look at what the process did. If we expand the subtree, we can see all the files that this process touched, read, create, delete, and so forth. If we click on one of these files, we can see some of the suspected actions, like in this case, suspicious ransomware delete, that caused the correlation engine on the endpoint to decide that this was a malicious process. This is typically summarized in the trigger event, this ATC malicious process is a generic indicator for suspicious behavior detected in a running process. ATC is our advanced behavior process monitoring engine. I can expand these events further to show tons of detail, process paths, who ran the process, file hashes, and so forth, if I need this info as part of the investigation. In particular, notice this batch file that was created by the process. If we expand that, we can also see that this was flagged as suspicious. Although this information is assembled into this process tree under root cause analysis, I can also look at this in more of a timeline view via the events tab. This is a more detailed representation of all the activities that took place, broken down into file events, process events, and so on. For example, here you can see how the desktop click on me.exe process started, and then invoke this temporary version just a moment later. This events tab contains a ton of detailed info about exactly what happened on the endpoint, if the previous screens didn't give you enough information already. With that said, for this simple use case, I think we have a pretty good idea what's going on, so let's pop back to the incident summary screen. Now, just in case this attack might be ongoing, one of the first things we can do is isolate the device so that the targeted system, if compromised, won't go around infecting other systems. Yes, the malicious process was blocked, but better to be safe than sorry. What this does is turns off all inbound and outbound access to the affected device, except for access to the Viper console and for any exclusions you define. This will allow you to continue to issue agent commands to the endpoint, like running scans and so forth, and to use the remote shell. But you can also use the exclusions to allow things like GUI RDP access from your desktop and things like that.
Now that we've isolated the device, let's take a closer look at the endpoint and see what we can find. Remember that bad.bat file that we saw created by the malicious process? Let's check that out. All I need to do is click on remote shell and the shell will pop up at the bottom of the screen. Once connected, a little list of commands is printed as a reminder. Note that this is a restricted set of investigation commands that are safe, by which I mean the shell can't be used by a bad actor to compromise additional endpoints. We'll just switch to the user's desktop and then grab that batch file we saw in the telemetry. We'll use the put command, which will push the file from the endpoint into Viper Cloud. Note that the original executable is gone because the agent quarantined it. And now let's look at the last tab of the incident, the history. Here you can see a full audit trail of everything that's been done to the incident. For example, you can see me starting to investigate. Note at the top the remote shell event and note that we collected some evidence, that batch file. If I click on that, you can see some more info, but also some actions we can take. Submit to virus total, look it up in Google, that sort of thing. The other thing we can do is to submit this file to the built-in cloud analysis sandbox, which will attempt to run the file in a safe environment and examine exactly what the file might do. So I'll submit the file and let it run. Running the file in the sandbox will take a bit of time as we let it run for a bit to see what happens. So in the meantime, let's take a quick look at more details about the device that was targeted. Back on the summary screen, we can click on device details to get into the device info, starting with an overall operational summary. You can see the agent status, whether it's up to date, running a scan, et cetera. At the top right, you have a bunch of commands you can run at any time, reboot the device, scan for apps, and so on. I won't go through all the tabs here, but I'll just show you really quick the web activity tab, which shows a couple attempts to visit a phishing site, might indicate that this guy engages in some risky behavior. The applications tab shows what apps are installed on the device along with any known vulnerabilities. The events tab allows you to search through all raw and security events for this device specifically outside the context of the incident. The events tab at left lets you do that across all devices. And finally, the timeline tab summarizes all the threat activity we've seen on this device over time. From here, we'll pivot to look at a specific threat type over time. This is the same as our threat summary report, but filtered for this specific threat. If I look at the full threat report, I can see all sorts of threats, but easily filter back down to the one I'm interested in. Also in reports, you can see the full audit trail for all remote shell use, including use outside the context of a specific incident. This may help if one of your admins accidentally breaks something. And the last things I'll show you from the main menu here are our link analysis and file analysis tabs. As I mentioned, these allow you to send arbitrary files and links to remote cloud sandboxes for deep forensic analysis and to return a full report on the behavior of that file or the site that was visited. Looks like the analysis for that batch file has returned with a result. So let's look at the details. You can see that its behavior was monitored in great detail. And in this specific case, it was trying to reach out to a malicious website. Not good. The results here look sort of like what you saw in the incident. Here's the process tree, but are the result of executing this file in a sandbox, not on production endpoints in your environment. Below, you can see detailed actions and indicators of compromise, as well as screenshots of what was seen on the screen during analysis. At this point, I think we know enough. Let's go back to our incident and cleanup. First, we'll go into the remote shell again and delete that malicious batch file. Same as before, I'll switch to the desktop, but this time I will delete the file in question. Next, I'll go back and close out the incident. First, I'll add a note. Let's say something like, send this guy to SAT. Then I'll close the incident. In this case, this is a true positive because this really was malicious, but you may find sometimes that it's just people doing their jobs. And with that, we're done with the demo. We hope this demo gave you a good overview of the incident response capabilities of Viper's EDR product. If you have any further questions, please reach out to the Viper sales team or one of our qualified partners, and we'd be happy to help. Thank you.